Okay, so we're on to chapter four of Further Stats 2, which is something called Combinations of Random Variables. And this is a nice small chapter. It's only got one exercise, and then I'll do some exam questions that go with this. So I was trying to figure out when do I want to talk to you about this notation clarification that I've got here. And I'm probably going to mention it to you at several points, but I just wanted to kind of put it explicitly here because chapters four onwards tend to be using a lot more notation, particularly this distinction that we have here between capital letters and lowercase letters that we've got here. So I've got some things I want to clarify. If we have a capital letter X, it is a random variable with its own distribution. So when we're talking about capital X, we're kind of talking about the whole collection of potential things that could be selected from that. As soon as we go to a lowercase value, lowercase x here, it becomes a particular observation from that random variable. So capital is kind of covering all of the things that could possibly happen, whereas if we have a lowercase one, it's like a specific observation. So capital X could be like all of the heights that there could be in, say, your year group at school, whereas x could be the height of your best friend. So it's a specific one. If we have these lowercase ones with these little subscript numbers here, so I've got x1, x2, x3, all the way to xn, this is a particular sample of n observations from x, capital X in this case. So these lowercase ones are saying I've observed n different things as a sample from this part that we've got here. Whereas when they become capital letters, like this one, x1, x2, x3, up to xn, this is a sample of n observations from x, but each of xi is not specific yet. So in this case, these could all be particular numbers, whereas the sample of things that we've got here, they are going to be a sample. They haven't actually been selected as particular values yet. We're just saying that they will be selections from it, which is why we're using that kind of capital letter to describe it. And the reason we use i, I guess we use i because it's sort of somewhere in the middle of like the alphabet, rather than saying n. n tends to mean like the last thing in something that we have, whereas i might be something that is kind of partway through. So when I say x i, I'm just saying it is referring to one of these things that we've got here. So for example, if my x was distributed, my random variable x was a binomial distribution with 100 things and 0 0.3, where x represents how many games out of 100 are won, given that the probability of winning is 30%, well, if I win the game 25 times, I could say that x is equal to 25. I could say that lowercase x is 25 because that's a particular observation of 25 from this distribution that we've got here. If I repeat the experiment of 100 games three times and I win 32 times, 38 times and 24 times, then I have a particular sample of three observations from x. So it's kind of lowercase. I could call this x, x1, x2 and x3 as lowercase. If I'm going to repeat the experiment of 100 games three times, I will have a sample of x1, x2, x3. But I haven't actually got what the data is or what the observations from that distrib distribution actually are. So my point that I'm making here is that if we are using an uppercase letter, it is generalized. We don't know what it's going to be. It's representing the whole distribution. Whereas if we use a lowercase letter, it's for a particular or specific observation that we have, and it is not referring to the whole distribution. Now, this is going to be important as we come across some things in this video but what I also in this playlist really but what I wanted to do is to kind of drill back down onto this idea of combinations of random variables as well as giving you some of this idea around notation I wanted to kind of give us a bit of a motivation about why we might be studying something like this so for our motivation here let's say we know that the weights of eggs e grams is e is distributed normally with 62 and 3 squared. In other words, we know that the average weight of an egg is 62 and its variance is 9 or its standard deviation is 3. And we know that the weights of the empty egg boxes, this kind of carton-y thing that we have here, uh, which can contain 6 eggs, is B grams. I've used the letter B for the box and E for the eggs. And the average weight of a box is 25 grams. It has a lower standard deviation. Maybe it's because the machine is able to create more consistent weights of boxes, whereas chickens will have a bit more variation in the sizes of eggs. And it's got an average weight of 25 grams. And so the question is going to be things like this. How can we find a distribution for the weights of full egg boxes? Now, the reason that this is, I think, quite interesting is because we're going to put six eggs inside one of these boxes and each one of these eggs is going to have its own 
distribution. It's going to have its own variation according to this setup that we have of the normal distribution. And we're combining six of those with a box that is also going to be varying according to the normal distribution as well. And we're going to try and like drill down on this during this chapter. Now I've said here, note that the eggs and boxes weights are assumed to be independent of each other. So we're assuming that you know, if you have one small egg, it doesn't suddenly mean that they're all going to be small eggs because maybe they're from a particular chicken or that the box, the machine um, is maybe making particularly bad boxes or something like that. So we always assume that they are independent for this. And so then we would also, after having found this distribution for the weights of full egg boxes, we would try and think, how could we use this to make predictions about the weight of a full box? Well, I guess there are a few things that we could quite easily predict because inside a full box, we know that there are going to be six eggs plus one box. So if I was going to try and find the mean of a full box, I'm actually trying to find out the expected value of f. Remember that expected value is just that. Well, I imagine it's probably going to be the expected value of these six eggs, so six lots of 62, plus the expected value of this part here, which is 25. That kind of makes sense, right? You would expect the full box to be six lots of the eggs plus a box. So six times 62 plus 25. I'm imagining that the box is going to be 397 grams as the mean. But the thing that we're going to try and work on is either the variance or the standard deviation of this box that we've got here. And you might like to, at the end of this chapter, come back and see if you can work out what the variance should be for this. Okay, so we are going to skip on from this part here. I'm not going to answer this question, but this is going to be the kind of plan of what we would do. Because if I can find the mean and I can find the variance, then I can say what its distribution is going to be, and then we can answer problems. I guess I should say something else, right? I also know that it's going to be a normal distribution. I think it makes sense that if these are normal distributions, the distribution of the full box is also going to be normal. We've worked out that the mean is 397, but later on we'll work out how we can do the, um, the variance of this. And once you've got that normal distribution, then you can use this to make all sorts of predictions, like what's the, pr what's the probability that a full box is going to be more than 400 grams, for example. So that's kind of why we're trying to do this whole topic. In the next video, we're going to be thinking about what happens when you add or subtract random variables together and also what happens when you scale random variables. So a bit of a throwback, particularly this one, to discrete random variables from further stats one. I shall see you in the next video.